Hi, this is Katina. I am here with the um, Ask a Clarinet Teacher Live. One of the things I need to make sure that I do is uh, mute my computer, so you may hear a little bit of feedback in a second. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat bar. Um, hi, Lion. That is a fabulous uh, picture. Um, Franklin's here. Hey! Um, Franklin, your name always makes me smile because Franklin is my other last name, my um, last name before I got married. And so, um, and then it says Franklin Unknown, so that cracks me up every time I see it. So if you guys have any questions, go ahead and pop them in there now. This time I decided to just go ahead and start the live stream without an actual subject. I reached out on social media to see what people wanted to talk about today. So I got a little bit of feedback about things like articulations. Um, and that was mainly it. A lot of people want to know about articulations. So we can start there if that's um, what you guys want to talk about. So. I'm gonna get a read. I just got back from work, so <laughs> I barely have time to breathe before I start this live stream. I'm not gonna be able to do the live stream for a couple of weeks uh, just because I have some meetings next week that conflict with it, and also the week after that is the Mason Summer Clarinet Academy, so that ends right at four, but usually our last day goes a little bit longer so people have a chance to say goodbye and talk and do feedback and things like that. So this will be it for a little bit, um, and then I've had a good time doing all these chats. Hopefully everybody will be back to their normal clarinet playing um, sooner rather than later. I started these, I had been doing these, but I started doing them weekly once we all went into uh, quarantine for the coronavirus. So hopefully we will be able to um, go back to you know private lessons and bands and rehearsals and gigs and all the things we were doing before this started. So. Let's talk a little bit about articulations. So this is one of the biggest ones that obviously we need to work on with clarinet. If you were to rank them, it would be um, sound and rhythm and accuracy. Hello, man of suits. Howdy. Um, so these, uh, th you know, articulations are definitely up there. And one of the, the things that I see with young clarinet players is that articulations can be very difficult to do. So you want the tip of your tongue to the tip of the reed. So right about there. And the tip of the reed, hi Franklin again. <laughs> um, and so the tip of the reed, it, it feels very close to the tip, but it ends up not being as close as you think. So if you haven't looked up the Ray Wheeler clarinet x-ray video yet, please do. He takes one for the team for us. It is a full minute of him x-raying his head or somebody x-raying his head while he plays the clarinet. And you can really see how the tongue is enormous in our mouths. And so when it feels like we're using the tip of the tongue, it really isn't exactly what it feels like to us when you see it visually. Um, it's a minute, a full minute of an x-ray. So I, I really hope that he did not get brain cancer. Um, tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed. Say that five times fast, right? Yeah, that's difficult. So. That's really important. So when you're working with um, new players, double check that they're actually tonguing the reed. Um, I have seen students and they'll use their throat, they'll go like this, Ooh. you see how I'm moving there, Ooh. like that, and they'll tongue that way. I can't even really do it. So watch out for that that glottal stroke that, that young people will do and try and nip that one right away. So one of the things you can do to help people tongue the reed is you can um, soak the reed in, in something flavored just a little bit like um, you know, a, a minty mouthwash. I've, I've done a Kool-Aid, so it's, ch I mean, do not use your good reed for this because you're gonna destroy it with the sugar. But if you can soak it in something and then say taste the reed, that really helps. So if you're having trouble articulating yourself, Go ahead and soak it in something that has a flavor and then you can taste the reed and that'll help you get the idea of or that feel of tonguing the reed. They used to make flavor reeds which I thought were hilarious and I never got any but I really wish I had because I would love to try some. Another thing that works with working on articulations is really fun. In the summertime you can do it with watermelon seeds and any time of the year you can do it with rice is put a grain of rice or a watermelon seed in your mouth and spit it out. And that's also good for air because you're really going to need a lot of support and a lot of focused airstream to, to get that moving. So that's a great way to get that t -t -t uh, th feeling for articulations. Um, another one to watch out for is anchor tonguing. So anchor tonguing is when you lock the tip of your tongue behind your bottom teeth 
and then you, you tongue with the middle part of your tongue. Now, some people can do that very successfully, um, but most people that I've worked with really struggle with getting fast articulations and light articulations and legato articulations with that. It tends to be a very heavy articulation. So those are some of the things to watch out for. Definitely that glottal stop because it also can cause a lot of tension in the throat. And then sometimes it's, it's led to that upper palate leak for some of my students where it's like, like that so so definitely watch out for that one because that can cause um, tension and um, physical problems later on all right so I'm seeing some questions come through um, song suggestions can you do the Super Mario Brothers theme yes that is on the list um, I have my very very long list um, and I can see if I can find which number it is um, I you know, if I actually got my act together and did it on, you know, like online and like a doc, that would be great. But so far I've just been using this piece of paper. So, and I write it as tiny as I can so I can get as much on one paper. But Super Mario Brothers is on there. That's a great one. Um, yes, one will come out tomorrow that I'm very excited about. Um, and then, um, but Super Mario Brothers is on there. That's a good one. And as always, if you're tired of waiting for your song, um, you can bump it up to the the first one and I'll do it that within two weeks for you um, And it's fifteen dollars, but I have that information on my website and I have that linked in the um, The about me section of YouTube. Otherwise you just hang out and wait and eventually I'll get to it um, There's some good arrangements of the Mario Brothers theme for clarinet quartet um, And it's really really fun to play. It's really good um, oh, the flavor reads were horrible. Thanks for the feedback, Man of Suits. I'm really glad that I didn't have to deal with it. And then Angry Teacher 577 Tink Squidward. I should do SpongeBob also, a SpongeBob um, tutorial of how to play that. Um, so, um, yeah, those are basically the big ones with articulations. Let's talk about how to articulate faster. Um, Oh, wait, wait, Helen got a question in there right before I started. Why is it I can't articulate high C on a bass clarinet? Oh, yeah, that's a thing for sure. Um, great question. Articulating on a bass clarinet is a lot different than B-flat clarinet. You know what? Next time I'll have my bass clarinet out when I do this too. Um, because you have to really change your voicing inside of your mouth. Um, so for bass... You know, I'm one of these very kinesthetic players. It's everything how it feels. It feels much different than a B flat. So if you're approaching articulations on a bass the way a B flat works, um, I think you'll always be disappointed. So here's um, my suggestion with the bass articulation. Explore where to hit that reed with your tongue to get that articulation to work for you. You have a big palate there. Those reeds are big, right? So you can have different spots that you can articulate on that reed that work for you. With me for bass, if I'm remembering, remembering correctly, it feels like I'm actually tonguing above the reed. It feels like I'm hitting the mouthpiece a little bit. So don't be afraid to explore with different places to, to articulate. Now, for an exercise that works for bass, start on G right here, and then slur up to the C. Obviously, this is going to sound an octave lower. So you're going to slur up to that C and then start on that G. And so see if you can get those articulations that way. So you want to have these very connected legato articulations. Remember, the big thing with articulations is it's the air. It's not actually the tonguing. So you want to have that air moving consistently and all the tongue does is just interrupt that reed for a second. So you're just interrupting the vibration of the reed to create that articulation. That's why we're so versatile with the articulations that we can create. You know, we can get some really short like uh, uh, slap tonguing articulations. We can get really short tonguing on really short staccatos on their own. We can get beautiful connected legatos. We can get beautiful lifted legato style articulations and that really is all about just where and how you're interrupting the vibration on that reed so don't think so much about articulations as hitting the reed with your tongue think about it more as interrupting the vibration of the reed and the only way we can have that reed vibrating is to have a good strong well supported airstream <laughs> ways you can practice that getting that feeling of interrupting the reed vibration is just holding an open G like I did 
keep the air moving and then touch the reed very gently with your tongue. It's like you're tasting something that might be really bitter or really sour and you're like, Ugh. you know, Sour Patch Kids, the first one I usually have, it's like, uh, you're just a little hesitant. Do that with the reed and let the vibration of the reed overpower your tongue and bounce your tongue off the reed. <laughs> It should feel that buzz, it should tickle it, it should buzz your reed, like, you know, if you had bad yogurt or something. Not that I would know, that's not true. I would absolutely know what bad yogurt tastes like. Um, yeah, and one of the cool things that um, you can do actually while you're even watching the live stream is practice this at home. So if you have your clarinet out, try that buzz in the open G and let me know how it goes for you. Remember, we wanna be as delicate as we can with the articulations. You don't wanna be heavy. That's how you get fast. Uh, it's so awful in, a, in Virginia because the chromatic scale is slurred up and tongued down 16th notes, quarter note equals 120, and it's hard to get 120, you know, um, 16th notes in the chromatic scale when you're thinking staccato, and that's what it says. It says staccato on the way down, which is such a bummer. Um, it really should just say articulated on the way down, and if you think of legato articulations on the way down, the faster you go, the more separated they actually sound, even though you're you're keeping that airstream steady and very legato style articulation. Um, so yeah, with the C, with the bass clarinet, um, keep the air supported, keep that C speaking beautifully. So if you can hold that C as a whole note, just try interrupting the vibration, but don't be afraid to really put your tongue like way up here. Um, but some people find it works for them lower on the reed on bass, but just keep using that tip of your tongue. Um, I actually, you know, um, with the low notes on the bass, sometimes I will anchor tongue lows if I want a really powerful articulation because I'm not getting it with the tip of my tongue. So I feel like with bass clarinet, I'm a lot more um, creative and flexible with how I articulate. Um, great question. Thank you. Um, so Helen, good one. And then um, Kayore, oh, it's your beautiful name that I missed last time. Um, Kai, Kayor, Kayoreka, um, hi, <laughs> um, Man of Suits, I play bass clarinet, your throat plays a lot into the back pressure of the reed, yes, that's excellent, that's really good advice, I, yeah, I feel like it's a just different feeling, if you really want a different feeling, play tenor saxophone, I have to open up so much more when I play tenor, it feels really awkward to me, um, so um, the Super Mario theme would be nice. Okay, um, Starla, how can you tell what line you are playing on a piece of music? Ooh, that's a great one. Aiden, that's, <laughs> does that say help? <laughs> Aiden, oh, this is hello. Hi, <laughs> uh, Man of Suits Virginia player here. Oh, um, yeah, I'm in Virginia too. I've had a lot of, Vir I've had a lot of Allstate students on bass. Um, and um, yeah, you have a lower um, tempo marking for the um, chromatic scale in Virginia, but um, yeah, it's, it's the worst. Actually, you know what, Man of Suits, will you correct me if I'm wrong? Please tell me it's not 120 for bass clarinet. I thought it was 100, but I, it's, I could have forgotten that one. And then clarinet player says hi. Okay, so great question from Starla. How can you tell what line of mu music you're playing? Um, so um, this one is really interesting and there's a lot that goes into this. So if you're really into neurology or how the brain functions, there's a really great book by Oliver Sacks and I forget the title, I think it's called Mind's Eye and in it he talks about a pianist um, and this is not where I'm saying you're going, Starla, at all. Um, but she started having trouble reading music, and then all of a sudden she couldn't read music at all anymore, and it was because she had a stroke. Now, I'm not saying you had a stroke, but we take certain things for granted reading music that um, can be tricky for us. So I had a concussion a couple years ago. Luckily, I was able to still play and read music, but what was difficult for me was the line of the quarter note or the eighth note against the lines of the staff would make it hard for me to read. It just would look like it was moving a little bit, but mine was not like other people. I've had uh, clarinet teacher colleagues that have posted in some of our clarinet groups that we're in saying, hey, listen, I've got this student that all of a sudden can't read music anymore. And I'm like, go oh, have him checked for a concussion. Or I have this student that all of a sudden can only read whole notes, but as soon as you put 
a, um, a flag on there or a stem, can't read music anymore. So um, reading music is a little trickier than it seems. And if you study the history of music, it goes back 2000 years to the Catholic Church and how they would write out chant with um, with news and things like that. And it's really neat to see the old music and how it is developed because it didn't used to have those lines. Anyway, let me grab a piece of music so that we can talk about the lines. Let me see if I can get a nice easy one. So if you're having trouble reading the lines, um, my suggestion is to try just a colored pencil and see if that helps your eyes see the line. Um, this used to be a problem for me with sight reading in an ensemble. If I was sight reading on my own, it wasn't a problem because I could pick my own tempo and slow down. You're not supposed to, but I could if I needed to. So I had a safety net. But if I'm in an ensemble, and especially if I'm playing jazz, which is a different font, and they don't put the key signature at the beginning of each line, that was challenging for me to, um, to find my line sometimes I would lose my line or sometimes I'd look up at the conductor and I'd look back down and I would not know where I was so the other thing that helped me with this was starting to just have more familiarity with the music and memorize it a little bit also music theory helps too because then you'll be able to predict what's going to happen next so for instance um, I know that this is gonna land it looks like it's uh, landing on the dominant here let me find a good example. So if I have a quarter note rest, right, that also gives my mind and my eyes a chance to look ahead right there. So that helps too. So use the rests and the long notes to your advantage so that you can look ahead to where you're going. And then I'm trying to find something like, okay, um, so this scale here, you've got a D down to a G, but it's filling back into a C. That is, um, that's a, that's a pattern, right? So, um, that I would know from music theory is five, one, you know, the G is going to the C. So that would be something to help me know the line. But also this is a hard one because we've got two of these lines right here that are a match. So this would be a trap for me. This would be one of those lines where I'd be like, oh wait, which one am I on? So I'm fine. If I find that that's a practice issue for me or a performance issue for me, I might try the colored pencils there to see if that helps direct my eye a little bit better. Um, but um, eventually you want to get out of that habit because you know, you'll be sight reading or playing in ensembles and you won't be able to use colored pencils. Um, double check also, just going back a little bit to the um, conversation I said about the brain, just double check with um, also and you know, your doctor, do another eye test, make sure that you know, everything's working okay. I'm one of those people that just wants to make sure that everything is <laughs> working with me as well as my clarinet. And I, I really wasn't that way <laughs> until I had a concussion. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I should probably pay more attention to what's going on. Um, but that's a good question. Hopefully those, some of those, those tips will help. Um, okay. Um, oh yeah. Somebody, I'm just briefly reading here with tempo. If it's fast, it's also harder too. So if you're practicing, slow it down and practice going over those lines and see if that helps for you. Um, okay. Um, do you have a tip on how to play high notes when going from a low G or A to a high B natural or C? Okay, so um, are we talking low G down here, like this, to B over the break here, or or this B here? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna have you write that question again. Let's call this G1, open G is G2, over the break is G3, and altissimo is G4, and then the other notes will correspond to that. So if you're doing, um, low G or low A, are you going to B2 or B3? So if you can fill in that question, just so I know which ones you're talking about, that will help. Um, okay, so I'll have to check on the tempo, but either way, I was thwarted by clunky peaky keys. Oh, so you were saying that thing about uh, Man of Seuss about the um, bass clarinet um, with the tempo for chromatic, and, and it helped me answer the other question with the line um, of music too, because if it's going fast, that, that also makes it um, easy to mix up lines. So thank you. Um, yeah, no, clunky pinky keys. Have you done the exercise where you go like this? Or you go like that? 
Those are always fun to do. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for helping me with my clar play my clarinet, and now I know the best clarinet. Oh, thank you, thank you very much for thanking me. I um, I've told this story on many live streams, but um, I had a student years ago that came to lessons, and he said I taught myself everything I know on YouTube, and he it was terrible. Like he had all these bad habits and bad embouchure and bad hand position and tonguing with his throat, and I was like, oh my gosh, don't go to YouTube, don't learn on YouTube. YouTube. And then um, it was like swimming upstream. Everybody goes to YouTube to learn stuff. I go to YouTube to learn stuff. I had to change my battery in my computer. Where did I go? YouTube. And so I thought, oh, I might as well just try and make some of these videos. So at least you get some good solid foundations and then you can learn a nice song, you know, learn some fun stuff while you're at it because that's what, you know, that's what the best part about playing. Um, Okay, I have to leave right at 4.30 because I have a meeting today, so I'm gonna try and go fast for the rest of the questions. Um, okay, so Aiden says, I, I wish I could use the colored lines, but I'm colorblind, oh no! Okay, what about a shaped sticker? You know, like maybe you could get a sticker that's a circle and then one that's a square and then one's a triangle. Maybe that could help. Um, and uh, the other one, instead of using a colored pencil, I also have colored, uh, highlighter tape and I'll use that too. So um, I've also used the arrows. I've done an arrow at the end of the line. Like I'll do a giant arrow. Where did I put my music? Where, especially if it's one that's like a pattern. So I'll be like, all right, here's an arrow and I will do it to there. Also repeats get me too sometimes. So I definitely have to color code repeats too. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you, Epic Fails, for loving my channel. What's the difference between the wooden clarinet and the plastic? That's clarinet player's question. Okay, so um, the wooden ones are made of wood and the plastic ones are made of plastic. Oh, sorry, that was just not helpful. But um, so the wooden ones, um, there is a perception that they are higher quality because they are made of wood. They are definitely more expensive. There are some cons to wooden clarinets because they can crack. And when they crack, it is a huge bummer. It, um, it does compromise the integrity of the instrument. You can get it pinned, um, but it just hurts your heart when it cracks and it's never quite the same again. Um, so usually they are a step higher, um, but are, there are student model wooden clarinets and usually I tell people it's better to go with a high quality plastic clarinet than a, a student quality wooden clarinet because the student quality wooden clarinets do not match. Um, they, they just can have a lot of problems depending on the manufacturer. So the pla there's some good plastic clarinets out there, good composite clarinets. A buffet has a green line clarinet, which is like a composite of wood that doesn't crack. Um, and then um, I rarely have seen a plastic clarinet with silver plated keys. I think the Bakun Alpha has one with silver plated keys. And honestly, if you can get silver plated keys, I know it's more expensive, but please do. Nickel can leach into your skin and it actually is poisonous. In Europe, you're not allowed to have a nickel plated um, instrument. You have to have the silver or the gold plated. Um, so that's something to consider. Also, um, silver has antibacterial properties. Very tiny, but it does, which is why we have silverware. So um, that could be something to think about in the age of coronavirus. Um, so yeah, the, the plastic clarinets aren't going to crack. So those are the ones you're going to want to use in the beginning when you're learning, um, when you're playing outside a lot, definitely for marching band. So yeah, there's different times for plastic clarinets as there are for wooden clarinets. Okay, um, do you have any long tone exercises and tone improvement tips? Yes, and I definitely, I so I've been trying to figure out how to structure the videos and I think I should just start doing series. Is that a word? A series of, um, of um, videos and long tones is on there. So um, th let me answer the second part of your question first. Um, the best way to improve your sound is to listen to players whose sound you like to get a concept of sound that you want. Now you can also just come up with your own concept without listening to other people too, but it's also it's sometimes helpful to listen to other people. So find some clarinet players that you really like, how they sound, and try and start emulating that and matching that. So you want to have a good concept mentally first. And then a great warm up that I really like is starting on B natural and then going down half step to a B flat and then back to the B natural. This is your anchor note, right? And then up to the C and then back to the B like this. Very 
very slow and long. And then you're going to expand out in half notes. So then you have B, A instead of the B, B flat, and then B, C sharp, B. And you want it very smooth and connected, and you want to match those pitches as close as you can in timbre as you expand out. And then when you get to the octave below, then and the octave above, then you've you've done that whole one warm up. And I actually will pick notes that bother me. So sometimes maybe the E natural is bothering me, or my G is bothering me, and then I'll work into it that way too. Good question, but I really want to do that series. Um, okay. Oh, Tyler, you're colorblind too. Um, okay, open G to high C over the break. Oh, that's an easy one to answer. And I think um, it might be my last, um, just so that I can get to my other meeting. Okay, so if you're going from open G to high C and you're having trouble, start on the C and go to the open G. So with clarinet, if you're ever having issues with something, go with the, what the problem is, right? And so open G with no fingers over the break, think about it, you're putting all these fingers down, you're changing registers on the instrument, so we have to adjust our voicing a little bit. So go start at the problem, which is that C. Like that and then return to the C so C slur to the G slur back to the C now if that you, you're gonna need a lot of support over that break you'll feel it. you're gonna really push that air from the G to the C the other thing that's gonna do is help you get your fingers in the right place when people have problems going from open G to C there's a lot of issues there it's the voicing it's having a tongue position in the E position it's using enough air and support to get that to work but the biggest one and the easiest one to fix well actually it can be the hardest one to fix is the thumb so a lot of people when they play open G they they anchor their thumb right here right so they're playing G and then they have to get to C and their fingers are really and usually when they have their thumb anchored their fingers are far away then all of a sudden they have to get to C and it's like look at all that work you have to do right you have to drop all those fingers and then you have to move your thumb from the clarinet up and out and then back down and that is a lot of work and it's going to take you extra time so if you practice starting here C open G C and pay attention to that thumb let me know if that helps use a mirror to do it so you can watch and then or use your phone just flip it around you know put it on your video or your camera so that you can you can watch your thumb doing it but that is a big one I see that one a lot and you can hear it too and I'll have students play scales like this and they'll take a breath there. They don't need to take a breath there. They're taking a breath so they have that time to get their hands in the right position. So I am going to have to finish now so I can go to my meeting. So, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna miss us next week unless I decide to move it to another time. Maybe I can do a different time. But um, thank you everybody for coming. I can, let me see, I'll just read it through real fast. Um, pinky exercise, yeah, it's hilarious. Uh, the, the fastest pinkies. Um, same thing, uh, wholeheartedly on a high-end plastic. Yeah, thank you, Man of Suits. I have a wooden one, but my fingers are small, so I, I, but I can still play it. Yeah, careful with those small fingers. Silver is so much better for me, and it's easier to clean. Yes, it is. Nickel wore off for me. I was one of those people where I could wear the nickel off because of my, I don't know, chemical composition. It's a little bit of X-Men there. Um, thank you, oh, you're very welcome. And yes, let me know how it goes, everybody, with any of the tips, and I will sign off now so I can make it in time to my meeting. And um, as always, you can um, reach out to me on csweetie at gmail.com, ask any questions, and have a wonderful weekend. Bye.